Hey everybody, welcome back to Retro Mining News, my weekly video where I talk about what's new and upcoming in the world of retro console mining. This video is sponsored by PCBWay, but more on PCBWay later. First up this week is a really awesome project from Kotar Industries. They designed a fully enclosed 3D printed shell for the Sandy Cart Reader. So like the name suggests, this completely encloses all of the PCBs and the screen of the cart reader so there's nothing really exposed and it just gives the cart reader a lot more protection. Like if you wanna bring it somewhere or even if you just wanna keep it in your desk, it's not really gonna get dust and dirt and stuff inside of it. It's a nice touch that it has the labels on the outside like the switches for the three volts and the five volts there's all the cartridge slots are labeled with different names on the top here and on the side I like the design of it I like that it's simple and minimalistic there's not really a lot of extra things going on although I do want to mention that if you already have built a Sandy cart reader you will require extra screws and things to put this together at the time that I'm recording this Kotar actually has a few fully assembled with the enclosure units on sale on eBay so you can check out this eBay link if you want to buy one pre-made already but they've also released the 3d printing files on printables so if you want to print your own and you've already built the cart reader then you can go and check out the files on printables speaking of 3d printing files on printables I was sort of browsing printables after looking at that Sandy cart reader case and I found this really awesome open MVS case. Do you guys remember open MVS? That project is at least a, a year and a half, maybe two years old by now. I actually have an open MVS right here. This is a consoleized Neo Geo MV1C board. The cool part about the open MVS project is that it's a basically fully enclosed Neo Geo system that you could build from the MV1C arcade board. But the biggest problem, in my opinion, about the open MVS is that the 3D printing case files are too big to fit on a standard size 3D printer, an Ender 3 or a Prusa MKS Mark III or whatever the heck it is. Fun fact, I did print this on an Ender 3 standing up like this, kind of crooked on the print bed. So it's a little janky, but it did end up printing. So this project on printables is an alternative to the open MVS case that prints in multiple parts. So if you do have a smaller 3D printer, you can print this out into the different parts and then you screw it together, I think, before you kind of put it all together. I really like the way this case looks and there's even a render here that makes it kind of see-through and clear, which is really cool. It's a, just a render, but I guess if you wanted to print this in resin, it would look just like this. So that's interesting. One kind of bonus feature about this case is, and you could barely see it in the picture here, the triangle above the V in MVS is actually a power light. So if you have the console on, the LED turns on to let you know that the console is on. Oops, actually now I think I remember that there is a case light here, but it moves the case light from the front here on the original open MVS shell to the top above the MVS. So yeah, if you have an open MVS kit and you've never been able to print the case and you have a smaller 3D printer, here's your chance to have a really awesome looking open MVS 3D printed shell. I was looking at AliExpress and I noticed that Bitfunks has some new blue retro adapters. Now, before you get angry at me, just remember on the blue retro GitHub, Retroscaler is actually a sponsor of the blue retro project. So I believe any sales from here go to Darth Cloud and the Blue Retro Project. Anyway, so I saw this really cheap four controller Blue Retro adapter for the N64. I mean, it doesn't really look like anything special, but it does have all four controllers and it only goes to one unit, which I'm assuming is still using the ESP32. If you don't know what Blue Retro is, it's an open source Bluetooth controller adapter sort of system to let you use Bluetooth controllers for a bunch of different retro consoles. I like Blue Retro adapters that have enough ports for all of the controllers for a console. That way you're not wasting another ESP32 for every controller that you want to have Blue Retro for. There's also one for the GameCube. It's kind of the same um, box here and it just has GameCube controller ports on the other end. There are also these individual Blue Retro adapter things for the GameCube as well. But like I said, I probably would prefer getting an adapter that has all of the controller ports. That way you don't have to buy multiples of these and you're not wasting extra ESP32s for each individual port. They also have this really strange Sega Saturn to Nintendo GameCube adapter thing. So this allows you to use a Sega Saturn controller on a GameCube. I don't really know what the heck this would be used for. I guess if you wanted to play Game Boy Advance games, you can use the Sega Saturn controller, but I don't really know any GameCube games that would support this, but 
it's kind of interesting. So yeah, please don't yell at me in the comments. If you don't want to buy from Bitfunks, I understand, and that's fine. You could buy a Blue Retro Adapter from any one of these other people, and the money will go to a small business and Darth Cloud too. So if you don't want to support a big company, then you could buy from one of these small businesses as well. Next, we have a project that I probably should have seen coming. This is from X Rider. I already talked about some of X Rider's other projects. This is the Delta Station, which is a Pico Station alternative project. And then there is also a new PCB for the X Station here. So it kind of makes sense that they would design a SD card mount for the GDMU. So if you look at this project on Delta Island, you could see that this is just an SD card card extension for the GDMU so you don't have to put your SD card away into a Dreamcast to plug it in. So nothing crazy, but I still think it's a good use of PCBs here instead of 3D printing. Although I can imagine there's still probably some 3D printing parts here to kind of mount this in the Dreamcast. But I like the clean look of the PCBs and it even has some buttons mounted here for you to I guess manage the images, maybe reboot the console or something. So another interesting Dreamcast PCB related project from X Rider. Earlier this week, Gamebox had a Twitter poll asking people which handheld that they would like to consoleize next. I know that last year they had a roadmap of the handhelds that they were gonna consoleize this year, but it seems like they're trying to get people's feedback as far as which one that they want to see next. So that poll is closed and the original 3DS is what won. That means that the DS consoleizer that they were going to work on is kind of put on hold and now they're going to be focusing on the original 3ds consoleizer next i kind of saw this coming one because the 3ds i think can play ds games and two i think there's a reason that this is not the new 3ds because the new 3ds is a much more difficult console to work on than the original 3ds anybody who's opened a new 3ds versus an original 3ds can pretty much verify that. Although the original 3DS is kind of annoying to take apart too. None of these consoles are particularly fun to take apart and work with. It is kind of interesting that they mentioned that they had a design already for the original DS consoleizer, but they kind of scrapped it because the design was not robust, I guess. So it looks like they're trying to come up with some solutions that are not hacky workarounds, but they still plan to have a solderless solution for the 3DS probably using those pogo pins. It really comes down to whether or not all of the pins that they need to gather information from are exposed in the way that they can use those pogo pins. They mentioned that their roadmap is going to be updated and they're hoping to have this new consoleizer available by the end of the year, but obviously things can happen. Everybody's just gonna have to take this with a grain of salt. Next, we have a small PS2 digital teaser from Dan Koontz, AKA Citrus 3000 PSI. He kind of snuck this one on the end of that pixel effects announcement where they uh, we're expecting that the analog chips to go end of life for the N64 digital HDMI kits. But here we can see that there is a mini HDMI port in the back of a PS2 Slim. I think that's where the modem is, the um, RJ11 or whatever connector is. So this particular console is a no cut in the sense of they just desoldered that um, modem connector and that's where the HDMI cable is going. We're still waiting on a finalized list of the compatible board versions for the PS2 Digital. It's going to work with both PS2 Fats and Slims. This is a list that I just copied and pasted from my Discord but I think this might be a 70,000 version of the PS2 Slim because it has a 56k modem. So. Uh, it says that the 56K modem models are no cut. And what else is interesting is you probably also watch Macho Nacho if you're watching my video. He made this video on this IDE Resurrector Flex Cable thing from Gus, um, Gus Retrohack. I, I don't know how to pronounce that. But this is like an SD card slot thing for modded, soft modded PS2 slims. So there's this little flex cable that you solder onto the board and somewhere you have uh, an SD card slot coming out. So basically instead of using a hard drive for PS2 slim, you can use this and use an SD card for loading games and things. So this is also compatible with SCPH 70,000 PS2 slims also. So there may be a good kind of overlap between that mod. So if you wanna have an SD card slot for your PS2 slim or something, there might be a little bit of overlap between this and and being able to use a PS2 digital inside of it. But again, I don't know if this is a finalized version list or anything, so we're just gonna have to wait and see. I think everyone is really waiting for Dan and PixelFX to drop the PS2 digital soon. Before we get into the big story this week, I wanna thank the sponsor of this week's video, PCBWay. Almost every week I talk about open source retro console mods that require either a custom PCB or 3D printing pieces. PCBWay is a custom PCB manufacturer and 3D printing service.
this. If you need a custom PCB made, all you need to do is send them the Gerber files and then they will produce the PCB and send it to you. If you need something 3D printed, all you have to do is send them the STL files and they will print it for you. And they have a bunch of different material types that they can print in, including a really awesome clear resin. And if you're a mod creator, they even have injection molding and CNC services if you're looking to create a professional looking product. Thanks again to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. You can find out more by visiting the link in the video description. I'm gonna put a big asterisk in front of the big story for this week. I don't really know much about this project yet. This project is called Mistex and it seems like it might be a slightly more affordable Mr. system. It's still in development currently, so that's why I can't really say that it's a super affordable thing because I don't really know how much it's gonna cost for all the parts once it's finished. But this Mist X project is centered around this all winter D1 I think it's like a RISC processor. I don't really know much about RISC either. The Allwinner D1 is the first SOC of Allwinner, which is based on the RISC V core. I wish I knew more than this, but it's some kind of a new processor thing. This processor shows up in a Terrasic DECA board, which is a new development board from Terrasic that has one of those Allwinner D1 chips on it. I think in this picture here from Hans, Bayer, who I think is the creator of this Mistex project, I think you can see what that Terrasic Deca board looks like. It kind of looks like a stick of laptop memory. It's this uh, middle piece here, this like darker green in the middle. It kind of goes into these two slots here. So that's the actual Terrasic Deca, and a bunch of other manufacturers make these as well. But before we dig into the comments and things to get a little bit more information, I wanted to mention that I believe that this is still a development only sort of project. This is not what the final version of this is going to be. There's actually a comment thread here from CO. He's asking where to get that FPGA board. I think he's talking about the Terrasic board. Hans himself says that it's intended as a development platform and the medium term goal is to make an extension board for the QM Tech Artix 10 T board. I think that means that that's like an FPGA board that has one of those on it, or maybe this is going to be a hat for that. If we go to the actual GitHub for the Mistex hardware, I don't really know. There's not a lot more information here. It just has a picture of this thing. And then I guess there's the actual um, bill of materials and the Gerber file. So you can actually build one of these yourself. I've been looking at comments for a while now, and I guess I'll try to summarize it a little bit. They're trying to make a port of the Mr. Framework to this thing called LightX, which I believe is some kind of a Linux, um, I don't know, repository or something, with the goal of maybe trying to port some of the Mr. Cores over to other FPGA boards. So maybe that's not a super satisfying answer, and I don't necessarily recommend that you go out and try to build one of these right now. One, you're probably not gonna be able to find all the parts, and I think some of the soldering is actually kind of difficult. And two, it could change pretty rapidly what, the, what this Mist X project will look like in the end. I'm not really sure. But I'm hoping that the outcome of this Mistex project is to move away from the DE10 Nano, which is kind of like a choke point for the Mister, uh, for building a Mister right now, because those are pretty expensive. Sometimes they're out of stock. And it just kind of seems like we're forcing Mister into this one FPGA dev board thing instead of looking for other solutions, potentially with more features or the ability to run faster and more um, more recent consoles. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. I'm curious to know what you think about this Mistex project. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. That's it for this week, but check out this video if you wanna learn about a potential new Xbox 360 ODE. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.